when the government seizes you know, your life savings, $86,000, it can't hold it for eight months without giving you the ability to contest it before a useful magistrate left your honor. All rise. The Second Judicial District Court of the State of Nevada is now in session. The Honorable Connie J. Sandlin will preside. Thank you. Please be seated. Good afternoon. This is the time scheduled for case number CB 2101595. Would you make your appearances for the records, please? Your Honor, can I do a few Justin Hodder for the plaintiff, Your Honor. And Jordan Smith also for the plaintiff. Okay, thank you. Nick and Hastings for the power of the vote. Thank you. Are you also representing the named parties? Yes, Your Honor. For all the defendants. All right, thank you. Ms. Court Reporter, do you need the microphone for any of these people? I don't know yet, but I just heard her now. I think I'm good. Okay. All right. Then we will start the hearing. This is the time set for oral arguments on the motion to dismiss. Counsel, are you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead. Your motion. I'm sorry. Yes, it's a written motion. Sorry about that. Thank you, Your Honor. Would you like me to argue standing or proceeding? I would prefer you stand, but you can use the podium if you'd like. Would that be easier? Might be helpful. Okay. We'll move it over. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much. Your Honor, I'd like to begin discussing Mr. Laura's first claim for relief, which is the claim that the operative procedural operational statutes here are all fairs. And but primarily, I just want to emphasize that I'd like to be able to answer any questions that you have at any point. So we'll be grateful for any questions if and as you have them. So first, I'd like to direct you to NRS 277.110 sub 1, the operative language of which is we've cited it in order to page 13 of the motion to dismiss. It describes how state agencies, law enforcement authority, may be exercised jointly with any other public agency of the state and jointly with any public agency of any other state or of the United States to the extent that the laws of such other state or of the United States permit such joint exercise. So I would point out just initially in looking at that statute, contrary to Mr. Laura's characterization in his briefing, that statute does not allow only local cooperation. There are certain sections, a broader section that describes it as where it describes the act and does talk about local cooperation, but it clearly and expressly by its terms talks about cooperation with federal agencies of the United States. In this case, the seizure at issue arose from the Highway Patrol, which I'll refer to as NHP, the Joint Task Force Operations with Federal Authorities. So we looked at the federal statutes and at 18 U.S.C.A. section 981 sub E2, which is also described at page 13 of the motion, the Attorney General of the United States is authorized to transfer property, forfeit property, on such terms and conditions as he may determine to any state or local law enforcement agency which participated directly in any of the acts which led to the seizure or forfeiture of the property. So considering the actions and operations of NHP and the DEA as alleged by Mr. Laura in his complaint, we have a situation that plainly falls under the state and federal statutes just cited. The statutes are not ambiguous. Nevada statute allows Nevada law enforcement agencies to operate jointly with federal agencies if federal law permits it. Highway Patrol participating in a drug trafficking interdiction task force with federal authorities and then receiving distribution of property fits squarely within the scope of these statutes. So Laura's strategy appears to be distraction from this plain reading of these provisions. He has three alternate theories for why the court should not apply the statutes as I just described them. First, 
He argues that as applied, the statutes are unconstitutional. Not under the federal constitution, any federal argument in this case would be foreclosed because there's no case law whatsoever declaring this federal forfeiture statute's state cooperation and sharing provisions to be unconstitutional. So any federal cause of action would fail to state a claim, and any purported federal claims would be barred, theoretically, by the doctrine of qualified immunity. So instead, he argues that these clearly supported statutory provisions violate Nevada's constitution. This claim strategy does and must also fail for the reasons the motion was discussed in the health court that described it. The second argument is that only NRS 179 constitutes a valid basis for forfeiture in Nevada. But this argument can't prevail because it assumes that Nevada's legislature created a nullity when it created NRS 277, which, as we've identified, expressly allows state law enforcement operation jointly with federal authorities consistent with federal law. Statutes must be read, where possible, not to be contradictory. And here, it is more than possible to read NRS 179 and NRS 277 with no conflict whatsoever. In other words, Lara cannot explain why the obvious verity that there can be two different valid forfeiture schemes under which an agency can proceed, depending on what partners it works with and which laws may be validly triggered by a particular investigation. So there are jurisdictional questions there, and there are statutory types of crime with local area jurisdictional and area of law jurisdictional questions. He also cited any authority whatsoever to support the conclusory position that NRS 179 precludes Nevada agencies from seizing and forfeiting contraband under a parallel federal system. NHP has historically valid and validly pursued forfeitures under both systems. And the third argument against participation in federal seizure and forfeiture creates a strong hand. He argues that 18 U.S.C.A. section 1981 does not require NHP to participate in federal adoption and sharing. But this argument is irrelevant and unresponsive to NHP's motion. NHP does not argue that it must participate in the federal program because of that federal statute, just that it may do so. And Lara cites no contrary authority. Ultimately, as NHP points out in the motion, this question is partly academic because there ended up being no forfeiture or equitable sharing in this case of the property that was returned. Despite the risk of sounding like a patronizing high school civics teacher, here on behalf of NHP, I must emphasize the legitimate and ultimately governing legal argument that Lara's claims defy the separation of powers under which our government systems are fortunate to be required to operate. During every legislative session, the Nevada legislature considers presentations from interest groups like the Institute for Justice, putting forward bills proposing changes to various Nevada statutes. For example, in the forfeiture context, a legislator, perhaps in consultation with interest groups, might consider it inappropriate for Nevada law enforcement agencies to be able to keep a larger portion of forfeiture proceeds than state statutes allow in the state forfeiture process. So the legislator may sponsor a bill informing the rest of the legislature of these policy concerns related to federal adoption and sharing, for example, and propose to amend NRS 179 to limit any Nevada law enforcement agency forfeiture of seized property to be brought only under the state system, only under NRS 179. No participation in federal adoption or sharing. The bill might also add an additional required hearing component into the seizure statute, for example, 30 days. That is what they propose in the briefing here. To provide this earlier level of review and to be able to challenge the seizure before the filing of an answer. But these hypothetical changes would not be required by the federal or state constitution. They would be creations of the legislature. Because it's undisputed and indisputable that the legislature can create adjudication processes that are more protective than those that the constitution requires. The hypothetical interest groups may be involved in the development of these bills, but if they're unsuccessful or if they decline for whatever reason to engage in the legislative process, interest groups are not 
justified in approaching the courts as just another venue option to pursue change in Nevada's law. Well. Nevada's law is in this regard. Nevada courts cannot rule that Nevada's constitution precludes Nevada agencies from participating in federal statutory programs that do not violate federal constitutional protections. The Nevada legislature can make political decisions to limit Nevada law enforcement agencies' seizure and forfeiture practices, but that is the legislature's purview. Um, as discussed in the motion, relevant Nevada constitutional protections and standards mirror those of the federal constitution. Lara's filings do not cite to a single authority in which Nevada courts have ruled that the Nevada Constitution requires more or different protections than the federal Constitution in the context of due process, probable cause, or monetary seizures in the drug interdiction context. Therefore, because the disputed federal seizure, adoption, and sharing scheme does not violate constitutional standards, and there's no citation whatsoever in Lara's briefing or complaint to support a contrary contention, that uh, those processes like this don't violate the Nevada Constitution. I want to be clear, the current Nevada and federal forfeiture frameworks both already require that if criminal charges do not result in a conviction, any seized property must be returned to the claimant. Contrary to the picture Laura and the Institute would paint, we're not talking about an arbitrary scenario where claimants have no recourse to dispute seizures or forfeitures. Both the federal and Nevada forfeiture frameworks expressly provide for notice, an answer, stay uh, in, in, during pendency of criminal proceedings, and other due process protections which the courts have consistently held to satisfy due process requirements. Ultimately, instead of uh, seeking legislative policy changes, the Institute brings this lawsuit and argues theories about due process and bias, uh, murking the waters, and arguing creative constitutional norms. So, in summary, as to this first uh, claim that, that the processes that are being disputed are relative to the US, it fails on its face. NHP has identified the clear federal and state statutes providing for the practice. And in NHP, NHP's view, describing the claims accurately, they are not that federal adoption and sharing are ultra virus, but in fact, it's that the practice is inconsistent with what Lara and the Institute would prefer the law to be. Um, and I'll briefly uh, just shift from that to talk about the conversion claim, because if an, an act can't count by deconversion unless it's unlawful. Uh, and if we consider and apply the statutes and the rationale we discussed, the, the practices are not ultra-virus. And considering also factors of probable cause and the fact that the initial seizure was supported by probable cause, ultimately the actions can constitute conversion that they weren't unlawful. I'd like to shift to now talk a little bit about injunctive relief. And this applies specifically to the second and fourth claims for relief regarding alleged uh, financial bias and then the asserted, the asserted additional prompt post-seizure hearing requirement. So, a plaintiff has standing uh, to seek injunctive relief only when a threat of injury is both real and immediate, not conjectural or hypothetical. And courts have found, and we cited in uh, this happens to be at page three of our reply, it's a particular case where courts have found lack of standing to bring injunctive relief claims related to equitable sharing when the government hasn't yet prevailed on the underlying forfeiture. And here there was no ultimate underlying forfeiture. So, to discuss the, this real and immediate standard, can there be any realistically characterized description of what the conduct that Lara wants to join that can be deemed real or a real or immediate heart of harm to him? The allegations from his own complaint undermine the, any, any such assertion. Um, he alleges that he traveled, traveled between Texas and California going through Washoe County at least monthly, both before and since the seizure of issue. But with all those trips, he's been stopped once. Frame, I'll frame this hypothetical. Let's say that Mr. Lara had not filed a lawsuit, but there had been some media coverage of the stop and seizure. And someone else in the public who drives through Washoe County and sometimes had money in their car 
decided to file an action just for the injunctive relief and to say, I drive to Washoe County, I carry money in my car, I think there's a there's a risk of, of a threat of this harm to me of my money being seized under these circumstances, and so I'm seeking injunctive relief. Or alternatively, even if this complaint that we are that we need to dismiss brought all the claims that it's brought except for injunctive relief claims, and someone saw read about the complaint, got it from the court socket, and said, huh. I think I actually, you know, I go through. I should go to Washington County. I want to see this injunctive relief. If this hypothetical uh, petitioner or plaintiff or claimant would have a strained notion of a threat of immediate harm because they drive through Washington County with money, I think I would hope that that all the ticket given that that person would not have standing to say to seek injunctive relief. The fact that Mr. Lara did have that one stop where this incident occurred does not really change the calculus about the likelihood of whether he's at risk of a, a threat or of an immediate harm any more than this other person. We're not talking about something like a a, a check stop that, that the law enforcement agency sets up near where someone works and they're there every week. And so I know I'm going to get stopped and, and Let's say there's some allegation of that that, that checks off is unconstitutional. We're not we're not talking about a scenario where there is an actual and articulable uh, immediate and real threat of any, any harm happening again. It was a one time situation. And we're not arguing that he doesn't have standing to bring his damages claims or declaratory relief claims as we make clear in the reply. We're just talking about the injunctive relief claims. You can only seek to enjoin, you have something enjoined if there's a real and real is likely that it's going to happen to you. Um, so again, each of, the, each of these claims on which Lara is seeking injunctive relief are, are based on the Nevada Constitution and have been framed this way because he knows that federal law expressly provides for the aspects of seizure that he's attacking and uh, that those, they're supported by federal case law. So he must assert that the Nevada Constitution requires a higher level of protection for seizures than the federal constitutional standard. Um, but there's no there's no law, law cited and, and there's no law that I'm aware of that supports supports that uh, that position. But I'll move to the substantive arguments on those two issues: the, the financial incentive issue and the uh, leading to, to alleged bias, and and then the the earlier hearing issue. Okay, um, because the Nevada constitutional protections, standards, and analysis mirror the federal standards. And because Lara cannot point to a single case finding that proceedings under the relevant federal statute, this is 18 U.S.C.A. 981, violated due process based on impro improper financial incentives, his arguments are from analogous cases addressing other, which are mostly local and state forfeiture ordinance or ordinances or systems. But this court should not consider making a constitutional ruling on a federal statute that has never been found constitutionally lacking. As to the argument and the claim that due process requires an earlier or prompt post-seizure hearing for seizures um, under these operative statutes, again, not a single case cited to that supports uh, that proposition for currency seizures. The distinction between currency seizures versus property or vehicles, real property or vehicles. The only cases related to currency seizures that have been identified in the briefing indicate that existing statutory forfeiture processes constitute sufficient due process. And then um, just a, a discussion of probable cause. The factors that were present when Highway Patrol uh, stopped Lara and interacted with him on the dating question in February 2021 uh, include the trooper's perceptions, and, and these are these are all factors that are widely discussed in many of the cases about probable cause. The trooper's perceptions of Lara's nervousness, the short turnaround trip uh, vehicle rental to and from drug source areas, uh, his misstatements to troopers of how long it had been since he had last visited the drug source area, evidence of multiple trips to the drug source area, positive drug deten detection canine alert to the order of drugs coming from the vehicle and later the currency, 
possession of a large amount of currency and new $100 bills, which there's case law that specifically talks about that as almost a uh, de jure factor towards probable cause. Uh, and his lack, his lack of money, his lack of, sorry, his lack of knowledge of how much money was in his possession, conflicting with his story that it was his life savings. And then inconsistent statements about that money being his life savings uh, when it was comprised primarily of newer bills when he said he didn't actually use banks, just to make more inconsistent as well. The probable cause is not an exacting, an exacting standard and it's based on the aggregate of facts. Lara argues that the standard, the standard as if it was akin to a reasonable doubt standard of criminal trial, that any factor he characterizes to his benefit must be construed from that perspective in the probable cause analysis. But there's no law supporting the analysis has to uh, be that way. He argues that the initial dog uh, alert on the vehicle isn't relevant for a probable cause determination because Mr. Lara had already consented to search the vehicle. But that argument would only make sense if the issue was probable cause for the search. But that's not the issue. We're talking about probable cause for the initial seizure of the property, regardless of whether the search was consensual or the search was based on probable cause. And that was a, an initial seizure pending further investigation by the DEA. So the discussion of different kinds of dog alerts and dog capabilities goes to a potential burden of proof at a theoretical criminal trial or ultimate civil forfeiture proceeding. But here we're just talking about one of several aggregate facts establishing, establishing probable cause in the seizure itself. By any reasonable interpretation, if an interdiction dog <clears throat> alerts to the odor of narcotics coming from a vehicle, and then a large amount of currency is located in the vehicle, and the dog also alerts to the odor of narcotics from that currency, those events, taken together with the other discrepancies discussed in the motion and reply, provide a more than reasonable basis for the determination that there was probable cause that the vehicle and or currency had been in proximity of narcotics. When and how much and the details of the dog certification could all be matters that might be investigated further by the DEA in its determinations of whether to bring criminal charges or instead return the property. Again, the issue here is only probable cause for that seizure of the property for further investigation. Discussion, brief discussion of damages. Any potential damages based on a large delay in the money being returned to Mr. Lara are properly brought against NHP. NHP didn't have the money, had no control over what the DEA would do with it under a, a federally statutorily authorized transfer of those funds after the seizure. Laura does not allege that NHP had anything to do with the DEA's actions or decisions relating to the time frame or return of the money that was seized. He doesn't dispute that while NHP was the seizing entity, the DEA took over from there. His complaint, his complaint actually at the second page concedes that the DEA arranged and accomplished the return of his money and that the events surrounding that return had nothing to do with highway control. I just want to I'll just close my presentation at this point by just pointing out that the way that, that the claims are framed in the complaint here and the way that they bring uh, or they seek different kinds of relief and that they address different legal issues. demonstrates and, 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 and the, there's a reality here that this complaint is not necessarily an all or nothing affair in terms of which claims the court may deem have some viability past the pleading stage and which ones, for example, the claim that it's ultra virus to do what two statutes say you can do, pretty clear that that can be dismissed at the pleading stage. And you know, we would argue, uh, especially again, the due process claim for a, an extra hearing and that there's an improper financial bias the court can, there's not, there's not factual issues there, the court can rule that the cases cited are all about other kinds of forfeitures, that this federal statute has never been held by any court to be subject to any kind of failure in those regards. And since it's a federal statute that no federal court has ever attacked or, or, or stricken any part of in those ways, its allowance for a state agency to work with it in those regards 
the fact that, it, that, that the process is complex <coughs> and, and safe, so to speak, under federal law, allows the court to make a fair ruling on, on, on those issues. So uh, I, would, I would just emphasize that those claims are purely legal claims, or the arguments about those claims are, are legal arguments at this point, and can be ruled on here at the pleading stage with no concern. NHP also considers that as a probable cause, there's definitely sufficient, while highly disputed, um, interpretation of, of factual evidence at the time of the stop. But the, but the analysis is of the reasonableness of those officers and considering that there was that uh, minimal uh, indicia for probable cause. Um, and so you're asking the court to dismiss. You're not asking the court to grant summary judgment. So whether or not I agree with you with regard to the analysis of probable cause doesn't really uh, save you with regard to your motion to dismiss. I think the thing, I, under many circumstances where there's a high, potentially highly factual analysis, I would agree with you. The difference here is what the evidence is and will be, with maybe a small exception here of a, a hypothetical um, deposition of an officer or something like that. The video is made part of the complaint by Mr. Lara. The, the video... He, so as I understand your argument, you're arguing that the determination of due process is a judicial decision similar to a criminal case rather than a factual determination for the trier of fact. It depends, I would say it depends on the case. It depends on the circumstances. I meant as you argued it in this case. Right. So as argued with the evidence that is already properly before the court. And frankly, were the court to determine that it considered that it might or should deem that aspect, that claim, the, 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 which are the cause of actions um, that there are, that, that he has uh, damages and declaratory relief because the seizure or procedure wasn't supported by probable cause, the probable cause claim, the court could consider that it might rule on it as, as a summary judgment ruling instead of a dismissal ruling um, as the case, uh, the case law allows, where, where there are factual issues there. I'd like to start with just what the allegations are, what we know, and what we can prove is this court holds as it should for the case in proceedings. Trooper Brown pulled Mr. Lara over for a minor traffic offense. He complimented his driving. He said he wanted to get down the road. When Mr. Lara told Trooper Brown that he had his life savings in the car, everything changed. 90 minutes later, Mr. Lara was left penniless on the side of the highway. And we know what happened and what caused this sudden turn of events because we have video from multiple perspectives that show it. We see on camera that Trooper Brown and Sergeant Rigdon are saying amongst themselves that Mr. Lara's account made sense. Between them, they agreed that, oh, everything lines up. That Mr. Lara had receipts to show where all his money came from. And in Sergeant Rigdon's words, that the evidence, quote, jived with what Mr. Lara was telling them. But well before then, Sergeant Rigdon had already decided that he was going to pay all of the money. Even before getting out of his car when he arrived at the scene, Sergeant Rigdon had told the DEA agent that it was, quote, too easy to do an adoption, and that he planned to take all of Mr. Lara's money for purposes of handing it over to the federal government. Sergeant Rigdon and the other officers were fixated on taking the money so that they could hand it to the DEA to forfeit, and then send 80% of that cash back to the highway patrol to use however it wanted. As a result, Mr. Lara lost his life savings for eight months, eight months of wrongful seizure and detention, beyond even the federal statute of limitations to act on the forfeiture. Mr. Lara is seeking damages because he never would have lost his life savings, or at the very least, he would have gotten it back much sooner, if not for the four mutually reinforcing legal violations we laid out in our complaint, which also makes this a tortious conversion. And at the end of the case, we'll also be seeking declarations and injunction under the Declaratory Judgments Act, establishing that NHP acted ultra virus and unconstitutionally. So this case is about writing past wrongs for Mr. Lara, and also about writing the shift to NHP. 
And that is with fine procedure for civil forfeiture and the Constitution can't be circumvented just by doing an adoption of the Supreme Court and handing the property over to the federal authority. At the very least, we've pleaded by the fact to put the other claims. Now, I take from Mr. Davis' Davis's presentation and the uh, papers that we've been following that there's a lot of debate about the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a very important part the first claim is that the highway patrol acted ultra virus by not going through the highly articulated uh, statutory scheme that's laid out in Chapter 179. That scheme lays out the one and only path in Nevada law for a forfeiture to happen when a Nevada law enforcement agency sees the property. It doesn't say anything about federal adoption or equitable sharing. In fact, NRS 179.1171 subsection 3 says that if a Nevada law enforcement agency seizes property, the property must not be forfeited unless one of the only two things happen. First, the property owner can reach a settlement with the government, didn't happen here, or two, the seizing agency, quote, files a complaint for forfeiture in the district court or the county in which the property is located. That's this court, not a federal court under federal law. And I think it's especially obvious that the legislature didn't intend Nevada agencies to circumvent Section 179 to go through the federal adoption process because the federal process undermines numerous specific provisions in Nevada law to give rights to property owners. So 179 has a higher burden of proof. It has an automatic return of property upon acquittal. It has a right to court proceedings rather than administrative proceedings. It has a substantially faster timeline than the federal system. As common sense statutory interpretation, it makes no sense for the legislature to have laid out this detailed scheme, but to assume that agencies could wholly ignore it if they can find some government, whether it's the feds or another state, any government at all, who's willing to support the property without honoring the protections in the law. And Mr. Hastings doesn't contest any of that. Instead, the Highway Patrol is arguing that this other law, the Interlocal Cooperation Act, provides this authority. But that act doesn't say anything about forfeiture whatsoever. All it says is that when an agency has pre-existing powers, that it can exercise those jointly with other agencies. So the specific provision that Mr. Gates is quoted to you, NRS 277.110, I think puts the nail in the coffin of their argument, because the very first provision of that says that any power, privilege, or authority exercised or capable of being exercised by a public agency of the state may be jointly shared. But that assumes that there is actually this grant of authority in the first place. And the Highway Patrol doesn't point to any place that gives them this authority that they could be acting jointly, that they could be acting jointly. The only place to get authority to forfeit is Chapter 179. And it doesn't say anything about equitable sharing. It is, in fact, inconsistent with the whole federal adoption scheme. Just as a small point, they would also have to actually show that there was a written agreement for the Interlocal Cooperation Act to, to be in place. That's NRS.277.110, subsection 4. And there's no evidence that there is such an agreement. So I think the sort of the last gasp argument that they have is that, well, actually, these officers were acting as part of a joint task force with the DEA. But there's no evidence of that. It's certainly not in the complaint. It's not in the record. And if anything, at, their, at page 15 of their reply brief, they just claim that there was a task force. So at the very least, we need to proceed on this claim uh, to get to this fact issue. So I think that the evidence is that there was that an issue of just doing this on their own, going outside the bounds of Chapter 179. So sort of the last thing that Mr. Hastings said is to, to suggest that this court would be going outside the bounds of the separation of powers by ruling on this. But this is simply a core question of statutory interpretation. And the basic duty of the judiciary is to declare what the law is. And if, the, and if Your Honor agrees with us that Chapter 179 is indeed the exclusive way for forfeiture to happen, Your Honor isn't legislating from the bench or anything like that. You're simply declaring what the, the statutes are. And I think that the idea that the court can't be enforcing uh, citizens' rights just doesn't make any sense. And the Mack case from late last year confirms that the judiciary is the principal guardian of the constitutional rights of the matter. The second claim is that the Highway Patrol violated the due process protections of Article 1, Section 8 by being impermissibly financially motivated 
to pursue this forfeiture. And contrary to Mr. Bates' argument, there's ample authority for this type of claim. So the United States Supreme Court, in the Marshall versus Jericho case, laid out a series of factors that would likely suggest that there's this impermissible personal interest in the enforcement process. So some of the specific things that Marshall pointed to, and these are at 446 U.S. 249, are if officials stand to profit economically from vigorous enforcement, if their judgment is distorted by the prospect of institutional gain, if an agency is financially dependent on the maintenance of a high level of enforcement activity, or if the agency is getting money on the basis of the amount collected. Our complaint alleges all of these things are spark, uh, red flags and issue here. We see it in the officer's behavior on the video and in our complaint. Trooper Brown was going to let Lara go until he volunteered that he had the money. That's the paragraph 37 42 of our complaint. Brown and Sergeant Rigdon said Lara's account made sense, but they were laser focused on the money and made clear in their conversations with the DA agent that was their principal focus. That's paragraphs 45, 51, 59, and 65 of our complaint. They didn't investigate Mr. Lara at all for a crime once they had the money, indicating that that was their sole focus, not crime control. That's paragraphs 101 and 106. We also allege the Highway Patrol relied on equitable sharing money, paragraph 95, and that that reliance distorts the interests of its officers, that's paragraph 143 to 47. So this case is just like all of the factors in Marshall, and it's just like the cases that we cited. So the idea that there isn't a relevant precedent is just not true. In Harjo versus the city of Albuquerque, a district court found that there was a due process violation because the seizing agency in a forfeiture case was able to keep the money rather than giving it to a general fund, and that the forfeiting officials could spend as much as they see. That's the exact same situation here. In the Flora case, the Cox case, the Cerebellas case, the McNeil case, those are all pages 23 to 27 of our opposition, are all cases where courts deny summary judgment or deny motions to dismiss because there were allegations of just the kind of perverse incentive that we've alleged here. So there's ample case law to support this kind of due process claim. At the very least, it's a fact-intensive inquiry to figure out what actually were the officers' incentives that they were being faced with. Uh, and we need discovery in order to do that, to know, you know what the agency actually does with the money when it gets it, whether there are any restrictions on it, or if, as we look like, we believe, and if you actually just get to spend uh, anything that they get back from the technical sharing program on their own, uh, on their own program. The third issue is the lack of probable cause for the seizure. And I think the strongest evidence that there wasn't probable cause is that the officers themselves recognized that there was no good reason to take the money. Trooper Brown told Sergeant Rigdon that he was leaning towards letting R go, paragraph 66 of our complaint. He said everything lined up, paragraph 68. Rigdon agreed and said that the receipts jive with Laura's story, paragraph 65. He called the DEA agent to confirm it was something DEA would adopt, and he sent the money back to N and sent the money back to NHP. But that just shows that he was focused on the money, not on probable cause. And once NHP seized the money, they never investigated Laura for a crime, indicating they didn't really believe there was a connection between the money and the crime. So it's clear the officers recognize Laura was in the drug smuggler, and this court should just follow their lead, especially at the pleading stage. What the Highway Patrol is arguing now is just lawyers trying to reverse engineer probable cause after the fact. Most of the so-called evidence that they point to are innocent behaviors that would allow them to seize anything from anybody. It's suspicious to be polite. It's suspicious to have a rental car. It's suspicious to drive to California. It's suspicious to have gifts in, in the car so that it looks lived in. It's suspicious not to remember exactly how much money you have in, you know, in, a, in your life savings or in your bank account. These are things that any that are completely innocent, and I'm sure that if Mr. Laura had been in flight instead, they would say that's suspicious. So if you're on the blesses this kind of post hoc rationalization, it would eviscerate the probable cause standard. So all we really have is the cash, but cash isn't a crime. And as for the drug sniffs, they're of dubious reliability on their own terms, as we allege in paragraph 155 of the complaint. The principal sniff, the dog sees the bag in close proximity to the car. They're on a desert highway where there's really nothing else around. In fact, Sergeant Rayden pretty much told Trooper Brown where, the, the, where it was going to be. So I don't think that this camp has any, uh, any real reliability. And then the dog is immediately rewarded when he finds it. 
So you know, I think that there's just a lot going on here that suggests it's not reliable. At the very least, there are fact questions that we should be able to get into, such as these canine training history to know whether they actually have a history of reliability. And we want to develop facts on you know, the things that we indicated in our opposition at page 30, that there's a huge amount of evidence out there that almost all money is contaminated with drugs. So having a slip on it isn't particularly probative that the money that Mr. Lara was in any way connected to drugs. And you know, Mr. Hastings emphasized a lot about the video. And I just want to reiterate what we said in our opposition, which is we are very, very happy to report the lots of videos. We think that they substantiate everything that we allege in the complaint. But to the extent that the video that what Mr. Hastings is saying contradicts what's in the complaint, I would urge your honor to actually look at those sections of the video because I think that either Mr. Hastings' characterizations are untrue or at the very least are contestable. So for instance, when they say that Mr. Mara was giving inconsistent stories about the last time he was driving through Nevada, uh, you know, I went back and watched that portion of the video. He says that he drove through Nevada in December, but he doesn't say that it was the last time he drove through Nevada. So I think that this is a post hoc convention. And as for the first dog award that they emphasize, if you're not watching that portion of the video, all it is is an officer with a dog walking around Mr. Mara's car. He points to various portions of the car, and the dog jumps up exactly where the officer told him to. So I don't think that, I mean, that's just the officer getting the dog to jump up. I don't think that's particularly probative of anything. And I also know that they didn't even include all the footage, such as dash cam footage, that we also got through our public records request, which I think showed that the, tech, that the initial stop itself was arguably pretextual. So I think all of, all of these factors together I think there is certainly a very, very serious question about this probable cause. If Rana looks at the complaint and takes the facts as alleged, there is no probable cause for the future, and that claim should proceed as well. Our fourth case claim is pretty straightforward. Just that when the government seizes you know, your life savings, $86,000, it can't hold it for eight months without giving you the ability to contest it before a useful magistrate lets your honor. And far from the idea that there isn't any case law to support this, there is significant case law for justice proposition. There's then Judge Sotomayor's decision for the Second Circuit in Princeton. There's the Sixth Circuit's very recent decision in Ingram that we submitted to your honor's supplemental authority. Those make clear that there is indeed a due process right under the Matthews test, which we all agree governs here, for a prompt hearing. The Ingram case said it had to be within two weeks, and Judge Lepar would have gone further and said within 48 hours, just like the McLaughlin standard for somebody getting a hearing when they are arrested. So I think it's obvious, and, and you know, this isn't just these two courts saying it, it's the obvious conclusion that follows from applying the Matthews test. Losing your life savings is obviously a significant private interest for part one of Matthews. It's just as obvious that a prompt hearing here would have given Mr. Lara his money back. The moment he was able to go to court, the government returned the money immediately. So if he'd been able to do that in two weeks rather than eight months, he would have had his life savings back much, much sooner. The only debatable Matthews factor is whether there's a countervailing government interest. I didn't see any real argument of that in the briefs or in Mr. Hastings' presentation here, but at the very least, that would be a fact question for the government to have to put forward evidence that there was some overwhelming interest for why it couldn't provide a prompt hearing within eight months. And the government's responses to these arguments just aren't persuasive. So first is the one you heard again today, that, well, these cases are about cars. They're not about money. But the reason that those cases said that cars are important is because one, they're crucial to the everyday, you know, to someone's day-to-day -day life, and two, they're hard to replace. That is even more true for losing your life savings at $86,000. Mr. Barber would have been better off had a car been seized rather than $86,000. It would have been far more easy to replace the car if he had the $86,000. So I think the idea that you don't have a due process interest in your life savings is simply ridiculous. The only, and the only case that they have on this, this, uh, on this distinction between cash and cards is this Brown case from the DDC, uh, where that involved money as small as $5, not $86,000. And second, they suggest that they can wash their hands of responsibility just because they gave the money to the DEA. But the Highway Patrol is bound by Nevada's constitution and Nevada's law, and they can't wash their hands of it just by giving it to another person. And they're telling they can find any state, they can even just give the money to their Uncle Bob and supposedly now wash their hands of any due process rights. And I'd also point out that as we allege in our complaint in paragraph 78, and as you'll see in Exhibit 2 of the complaint, the Highway Patrol had the money for two weeks 
before it was adopted by BBA. And so, at the very least, within those two weeks, they should have provided a hearing to Mr. Lara. Our fifth claim is the claim for conversion. I think that the parties are in agreement here that it essentially rises or falls with the other claim. If everything that NHP did was lawful, then we agree they have a privilege uh, under conversion and it wouldn't, we have a claim to be valid. But if any of our other claims succeed, then the seizure or retention was unlawful and therefore a conversion. And I'd just like to briefly address the issues when it comes to remedies in this case. In so, first, uh, when in talking about damages, I would just note that the amount of damages is irrelevant at this stage. All we need is to say that we can at least seek nominal damages and all of our claims can proceed. And I think we have agreement on that. And the fact that the money was all given to DEA doesn't absolve the Highway Patrol of the damages that it caused. If they hadn't committed these four legal violations, either the money wouldn't have been seized or it would have been returned much faster. And both of those are cognizable injuries that resulted in real damages to Mr. Laura that he can be compensation for. And then finally, on the injunction issue, I think the key point here is that it's just premature for the court to decide whether injunctive relief is appropriate. At the end of the case, as part of our damages action, the court is going to determine whether or not the Highway Patrol acted unlawfully, whether it violated the Article 1 in the Art of Art, or Section 818 of the Constitution, and whether it even had the authority to do what it did in light of Chapter 179. I think Your Honor should decide then whether injunctive relief is also appropriate. There's no reason to decide that now, when we all agree that Mr. Laura has standing and the victim of movement issues, at least for his claim for damages. If the court has no further questions. I uh, have no questions. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Counsel, you can conclude your argument. Thank you. We don't just take it backwards from the evidence that are precious. NHP isn't arguing that it's absolved of any potential liability related to having turned the money over to the DEA that could arise from an ultimate finding of wrongdoing on any of the claims. The argument that was being made about the, the property having been given to DEA and then the, the eight-ish month, month delay there's no cognizable theory in the complaint or the briefing to point to any potential liability for NHP based on the DEA's del uh, timing delay in returning the money. So the argument isn't that NHP is completely absolved because they gave the money to the DEA. No, it's just that an argument for or a claim for damages based on the duration of time that the DEA undisputedly had the property is not properly brought against uh, the NHP. Um, this is an interesting argument to say NHP had the money for two weeks, so within two weeks it should have provided a hearing. Based on what statute? Based on what provision of the Constitution? Based on what knowledge that anyone would ever have that that, that should be done? And that this is the very first time this is ever being argued in the back. It's understood that under MAC there's no qualified immunity defense to a state constitutional claim that's been brought. But how in the world could anyone in NHP ever have a concept that they should give someone a two-week hearing when it's not in NRS 179, the wonderful NRS 179? It's not in there. It's not anywhere. There's no way that anybody at NHP could have known that there's any constitutional uh, requirement that they give somebody a hearing in anything other than what the statutes say because neither the federal statute at issue nor NRS 179 have ever had any ruling from any court stating that, they, that there has to be any pre-prompt, pre-hearing prompt post-seizure hearing. It doesn't exist. It's a creation of a new legal theory of what the Constitution ought to require and what you're being argued, Judge, that you ought to find that the Constitution ought to require. There's no reasonable person in the universe that would have any sense that they would give this person a, a two-week hearing. Because whether they were operating under federal adoption or NRS 179, it's not in the law anymore. And to that point, in terms of uh, this Crimstock or Ingram case and the fact that uh, this distinction between cash and and uh, and real property or, or uh, cars, frankly, the argument is that where we are talking about a federal statutory scheme that does not provide uh, for for this hearing, for this prompt hearing, 
And there's no decisions anywhere that, that as to this federal statutory forfeiture scheme, that it requires that. It's totally unreasonable to expect that, that NHP would have interpreted that that's part of the law. There is a great difference between $100,000 and $85,000. If it's your life savings, you know whether it's $84,000 or $9,000, whether it's $100,000. Councils argued that right from the very, very start, the intention was to take this money. And that's not supported by the video. The probable cause, and no use talking about it, it's not a bit. It's just not a fair characterization that any, any characterization by NHP of what the facts are are completely ad hoc post, you know, after the fact. But the characterization by Mr. Lara and his counsel in the Institute of what the facts are is pure and holy and, and, and is exactly what happened. I mean, both sides are advocates for their clients and are clearly describing the facts in a way that advocates for their position. That's the way it works, and that's, and that's what both sides are doing. The dog alert on the vehicle happened, and, and NHP troopers take that as, as, as law enforcement does anywhere, as an, one indicia in a list of factors for its probable cause. <clears throat> the Marshall case and the factors that counsel has discussed is, is not a case about this statute. The Marshall factors have never been applied in law that I have found or that counsel have cited to this federal statute before. And so my argument is, it's, frankly, it's not appropriate for this state court to rule that a state agency operating under that federal statute, which it is allowed to do, is, a, is, is uh, inconsistent with the Marshall standards. Council has argued that it's not quote unquote legislating from the bench to create a new hearing. But again, there's there's not there's no single Nevada case, no federal case about this federal forfeiture statute that describes the two week or thirty day hearing. I, I, I don't know how otherwise that would that is a legislative act. Um, and then just sorry, the last thing. Just because NRS 179 does not say within its terms that Nevada, Nevada law enforcement agencies can choose to operate under a federal um, forfeiture operational statute. If the federal operational forfeiture statute says they can, then they can. There's no, there's no law that's been pointed to as a rule for Nevada that Nevada law enforcement agencies can only operate under NRS 179. No, NRS 179 by its own terms does not define itself or identify itself as the exclusive forfeiture law for Nevada. Thank you for the opportunity to respond to those points. Thank you. Thank you. Council, uh, this has had a bit of a tortured history with the stay that was granted and the Supreme Court um, response to the federal court. Uh, but we are now at the stage of the proceedings when our, I am going to make a decision with regard to the motion to dismiss. I'm going to do so after a review of the transcript and your arguments from today. So once that transcript is prepared, which I will be um, requesting that you jointly share in the cost of, then uh, once that's prepared, the matter will be submitted to me and I'll make a ruling. Is there anything further for today? Thank you. No, All right, thank you for your arguments. I appreciate them. Courts in recess. All rise. Thank you. 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 Thank